Um, so I actually kind of want to reverse things. I actually want to start with a round of applause for the Student um, Homecoming Writing Awards winners. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot because I think one of the nice thing about this event is we'll get to hear from all of our student winners um, and have them read from their work. So essentially what I'll do is I'll introduce a speaker, they'll come up, they'll uh, do their reading, um, and we'll go through the list. Um, and we have one that's going to be happening um, that's a recording, but the rest will be live. Then we're going to transition into our flash talks. We have four faculty, um, including myself, who are going to give very short five-minute talks. We have a very strict um, uh, schedule on the, on the faculty because we have a, a way of going on for too long. Um, so um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the flash talks before we start those at the end. And then with whatever time we have left, we can do Q&A. Um, I'm just going to make an executive decision right now. For Q&A, obviously, you can ask the faculty about their research and the, th the things we talk about in our talks. But um, maybe you could even, if you want to, ask a student a question um, about what they present, um, if there's anything you want to you wanna sort of uh, bring up in conversation. And then we'll kind of wrap up around 1.15. So that's the general plan. Um, but this is friendly, casual space. If you want to get more food, tamales, you can sneak around. Um, we won't mind. Um, so without further ado, I, I think we should get started. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, with poetry, um, with Key Bukowski. Um, and uh, the name of the text that I've got here on the sheet is Vessel of the Valley, um, Brown Wood, November 4th. Um, so uh, Key was born in Cle Cleveland, Ohio. Um, uh, and has always been drawn to, to all has been always been drawn to all kinds of writing, not just poetry. Um, he's a sophomore at ASU studying English on the Tempe campus. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Keith. Hello. So I'm going to be reading. I'm going to. I've turned in three poems for the contest, but I'm going to be reading the end of the longest one, which is called "Vessel of the Valley." So here we go. <laughs> I lack the shape that you fill. Day trip to the Sedona Riverbed where the silver fish all pointed down south to the RV park. Rusted chrome behemoths reflected against red rock cliffs with bright yellow wheel chocks and newly emptied sewage tanks. Two men are casting out the lines of their fishing rods, wispy spider strands arching over the river. Not knowing all the fish are swaying upstream, but don't worry, I won't tell them because I'm getting better at keeping secrets. Laying there on an orange flannel blanket, watching them, my feet dig into a dry bed of long, ruddy pine needles, the shaft snapping as I flex my toes, imagining that each rustle is one of your footsteps coming towards me. When a passing cloud blots out the sun, I pretend the shadows dropping in a deep slant come from your body leaning over me, and not the ponderosa pines that have laid this cracking dead funeral bed around me. It is a weak moment. As I play pretend, one of the men on the riverbank catches a fish. It wriggles as its gills are cut, eyes and glass eyeballs withering in the dry midday air, hooked gulping lips sounding out every raspy syllable of your name. I am the one that shapes the lack. Mama is in the yard behind the tree line calling, bare toes painted with Lincoln Park after dark digging in the fresh cut grass, but I won't come yet because the sky is closing, the creek has finally dried up. I am cracking apart forked sticks like wooden wishbones, praying on your arrival tomorrow in my cul-de-sac, at the end of the driveway where I'll walk to wait for your dad's car. I'm praying you come hungry. The ravine V is broadening, opening space. One twig breaks clean, so I know it'll come, swift. I throw it down, I hear nothing, I set my teeth. The forest can't keep a secret from me, now can it? My body throbs. The worst is the not knowing. Mama's gotten down to the tree line. Steaks are off the grill. She calls it through the trees. Stomach empty, but I prefer your hands there instead of charred cow's meat. The riverbed flattens, going grayscale. Pulling no breath, I go back up the hill. The lack shakes me. Thank you, Key, and congratulations. Um, so next we have Fiction and Taylor L. Montano um, for The Sound That Never Stops. Um, after just one year of fiction writing, Taylor Montano fi will finish their senior year of their English creative writing degree at ASU. They have spent the past months developing their prose through an internship with Professor Blasingame, where they will have finished a YA novel, a young adult novel by winter. Very cool. They are likewise grateful to be the nonfiction editor for our own Superstition Review at ASU. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll just be reading the first page. 
The music plays, and we never turn it off, not willingly. We won't entertain the idea of it permanently stopping, despite there not being much to let our minds play with. It doesn't even matter what plays, so long as noise floods our ears. Some days it's classical, others it's jazz. It isn't always in a language we understand, but when it is, we have a better time memorizing the lyrics, and we save them, a weapon to defend us later on. We crave the music to overwhelm us because it's better than the alternative. It must, it has to. We crowd in a cold mansion enough to fit all 200 of us. The vents are constantly blowing air, keeping the hallway at an endless 61 degrees. We live in the hallways, as far away from the outside as we can manage, and take shifts switching the records on the turntables. There are so many of them, all smuggled or found here, and there's one about every 20 feet. We make sure that two people are by one at all times, one to make sure it stays on, and one to gingerly set down the records. Some of us savor the cracks and pops they make when a new record is starting, like it's clearing its throat before singing us back to life. All about 15 children clump around a music box that one of them found months ago. They recognize the nursery rhymes. Only they have enough energy to sing them aloud, whereas the adults will save their voices for when they truly need it. We rotate between the same songs each day, and those of us that want to live never get sick of them. It's a miracle we're grateful for, one that we'd never take for granted, though someone tried to three months ago. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, congrats. And now we have uh, a scholarly essay award winner, um, Sierra Elizabeth Bravo, for Titus Andronicus, whose tragedy is it anyway? Um, so Sierra Bravo is an English and film and media studies major at Arizona State University. An ASU online student, Sierra has a passion for storytelling that she hopes to nurture through her educational and professional endeavors. That felt like a teaser. It's like I want more from all of, all of these. Um, hopefully, it's not the opposite with us faculty. Hopefully, it, hopefully, it's not. We're not doing four-minute flash talks next semester. Um, so we're, we might as well keep moving because I think it'll be great if there's time for questions and kind of conversation and maybe just more eating. Um, so we'll we'll do uh, we'll stay online. Um, so the flash talks we've been doing these for a few semesters. First in person, then on Zoom. Um, and so the, the idea is basically, as faculty, you, you may not all realize this, but we don't always know what we're all working on. You know, we don't necessarily, we kind of maybe stay in our offices and, and kind of have our heads down too much. So this is an opportunity to kind of try to make our work accessible and short um, and present what we're working on. Um, so we have strict time limits, uh, five minutes. So Jackie's our timer in the front row. Um, <laughs> Brad, Brad's going to do uh, our Bradley Irish, uh, our uh, first presenter is presenting on Zoom, so I actually realized he, he might not be able to see Jackie. So, so we'll have to trust you, uh, uh, Brad. Um, so um, we're, we're going to have four presentations, five minutes each. We'll go through all of them. Um, the first will be on Zoom. The rest will be on per in person. Um, and then we'll do questions at the end. So if you have questions, um, please you know, write them down or bookmark them in your head. Um, and we'll come back to those at the very end. Um, so um, I'm not going to do a big introduction for these, uh, but I, I will just say sort of the title and name of each presenter. So first we have uh, Bradley Irish, who's an associate professor of literature. Um, and uh, I believe he's going to speak to us about envy and jealousy. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll have my own timer, so uh, I'll make sure I don't go over it. Um, so I like the book on envy and jealousy in early modern England, and uh, one of the things that always happens when I tell people that is they always go, so what's the difference between envy and jealousy? So I thought that, that really when I, when, when I sort of planned out this talk, I realized that in five minutes I don't even have any space to begin to talk about the early modern period, but I thought it would be great to just sort of say, how envy and jealousy are probably understood because that's something that a lot of people are So I'm just going to give you some definitions. First, what is envy? Envy is a negative emotion that occurs when we perceive that someone else, generally called a rival, enjoys 
is something that we want. It can be a possession, an absolute, or some other kind of advantage that, that, that we fundamentally want for ourselves. So, so it's generally uh, addressed to some sort of object that we want, whether it's a material object or it's a material object. And he was saying that there's basically two fundamental kinds of envy. There's malicious envy, when we want to take that thing from the other person. So we're the only one who is. But then there's also benign envy, which is when we don't necessarily want to take it from that other person, but we want it for ourselves too. So if, if an enemy gets a promotion, you might find feel uh, malicious envy. If a, uh, a friend gets a promotion, you might feel benign envy. And the difference between benign envy and admiration is really important because envy is separate. So if your friend gets a new car and all you are is happy for them, then that would just be admiration or happiness. But if your friend gets a new car and you kind of feel it in your stomach like, I really wish I had that too, that would be the Jealousy, on the other hand. Jealousy is also a negative emotion. But it's when we feel when someone takes away or threatens to take away something that we feel like we already or maybe fantasize about. So this is generally uh, in the case of people. So we think in terms of the prototypical example being romantic jealousy, there's also sibling jealousy, friendship jealousy. But this is always have to be. Um, for example, it is the kind of old step phrase now, but in earlier periods you hear things like a miser is jealous of his money, which means he guarded his table. So one way to think of the difference as as a philosopher has recently put it is that envy is the response to a perceived lack of a valuable object, while jealousy is the response to a perceived loss of a valuable object. And those things uh, I think really make sense when you kind of set it up like that. So envy and jealousy are distinct emotions, but they're also entwined. In regular English, for example, we often use the term jealousy when we mean envy, or we use jealousy as a wider sort of uh, construction. So for example, it would be very common to say, I'm so jealous of my neighbor's new sports team, even though technically, um, if you want to go by the philosophical definition, we're envious of that possession that we wish. On the other hand, the reverse is almost never true. We wouldn't say, I'm so envious that my spouse is flirting with our traffic is only sort of used, um, or envy is used in specific cases, jealousy is much more wider. But just stick with that example. If we reframe that to say that I'm so jealous because my spouse is flirting with our traffic is overheard, what we might instantly see is that envy is inherently implied. The speaker is envious of the attention that their spouse is giving to that coworker, and also probably to some degree envious of that coworker as it was. <laughs> so for this reason, most theorists argue that envy is an inherent part of the jealousy construct. Typically, um, whenever you're talking about jealousy in terms of, of people, there's going to be envy involved because someone is envious that their partner, their friend, their teacher, whoever, is giving attention to someone else. So jealousy and envy very much co-occur. In this case, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it everywhere, A is primarily jealous, but at the same time, she envies the attention that B is giving to C. So that's a really clear way of how envy and jealousy uh, are entwined. So the final thing to say is that envy and jealousy are because of this, commonly thought of as sibling emotions and the boundaries between them are also uh, are often very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. I'm very envious of your use of fonts in your presentation. Um, so uh, next, we're going to have uh, uh, Laura Turchi come up. Um, uh, Laura is a clinical professor at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies.
So I'm very excited to hear about this. Oh, so hi. So yeah, I'm Laura Turchi. Uh, if I look familiar to you or sound the name sounds a little familiar to you, it's because I worked here in this department in 2008 to 2013. Uh, that was back when I didn't need to write this out in large print. But um, anyway, now I am at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, ACMRS. I am the curriculum director for the Mellon-funded Race Before Race project, which is focused on amplifying pre-modern critical race scholarship. And so today I want to talk about how we are thinking about answering the question, what do more than 300 faculty across the globe think about teaching pre-modern critical race scholarship? And this is a work in progress. I am collaborating with two wonderful postdocs at ACMRS, Cornisha Tweed and Eduardo Ramos. So, function? No? Ah. <coughs> Nope. Oh, shoot. So close. What am I doing wrong? I'm sorry. Maybe we'll do a the signal over here. The person has to click on the screen with the mouse to make sure that the, the PowerPoint's active. That's had this problem before. Can we go to the next slide? Get extra time. You just have to have <laughs> clicked somewhere on the PowerPoint with the mouse so that when she clicks it, it goes forward. Give it a try. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so um, the first step for us for designing a, a new curriculum was a needs assessment. Um, this is where my social science side comes out. Um, so we're gonna start to answer three big questions which are here. Can curriculum innovation change higher education? What new materials will promote transformation of pre-modern uh, pre -modern curriculum? And can we make new content attractive to instructors and make its delivery adaptable to many teaching contexts? So you doing that or am I? There, no, the wrong way. Can you go forward? It should work now. Just, it should it work now. Once. Maybe we'll just, you can just signal and she Yes, can if, you can, if you can click to that one. There you go. Thank you. Faster, faster, faster. Um, uh, nobody does this kind of social science work without partners. We wanted to collect both qualitative and quantitative data, so we used a survey and focus groups, and we were greatly supported by partners uh, in design and pre preliminary analysis by CREST, the college research uh, and evaluation services team. And I am happy to share the full technical report on this study. It's on our website, and it's uh, pretty amazing. Um, also, our networks, as you can see, helped us push out this survey to as many people as we could uh, last spring. So, whoops, now yours. Oh, there you go. So who answered the survey? We had a terrific response rate. We had 333 people answer 100% of the questions, which was a very long survey. Um, and 98 of them agreed to participate in focus groups. We couldn't even use them all. Um, and the respondents, we, we can sort of read it on here. Respondents were from many kinds of higher ed institutions across the US and six additional countries. 68% of them identified as faculty, but many had multiple roles. 52% uh, identified as literature faculty, but a substantial number were in interdisciplinary assignments. More than 75% said they were teaching undergraduates, and not only majors, but general ed courses. So here's a little bit of what they told us about pre-modern critical race scholarship and their, re and their research and teaching. There we go. So um, we provided some definitions, and almost half the respondents described themselves as at least moderately familiar with pre-modern critical race scholarship. That said, 75% said that there was a lot of value in incorporating this scholarship into higher education uh, classrooms and coursework. If you click that, thanks. Um, of course, we heard a lot about barriers. There were t a lot of discussion or written uh, commentary about time constraints and teaching loads and those things making innovation and incorporating new scholarship difficult and the political and legal and sometimes administrative push against CRT is clearly real. Back in February, 25% of the people answering the survey said that this was a problem and I, I believe it's gotten worse. So it's a, a real concern for our project. Project. And nevertheless, faculty told us they were most likely to adapt or adapt different kinds of curriculum which we offered to them. We, uh, they said the most useful to them would be annotated reading lists, units of studies, and study and exemplary syllabi. Uh, at the same time, the survey gave them a long list of possible curriculum materials, and each one of these was met with uh, 
fair amount of enthusiasm. More, at least 40% of the people said yes, 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 yes to all these different things. Um, so we are working with scholars right now and creating multimedia and text forward materials that we expect to continue to be guided by the results of this needs assessment, which is answering then the question, what do more than 300 faculty across the globe think about teaching pre-modern critical race scholarship? We've identified these kind of three major themes that we're still thinking about. First, powerful authorities may dismiss PCRS, but faculty teaching undergraduates, again, 75% of the respondents, know it's important, know it's important for our students. Uh, second, race is important, and intersectionality is even more important to a lot of the, again, to a lot of the people that responded. And finally, it's not just content, but pedagogical advice is important too. So that's something I like. So now we're going to have uh, Richard Newhauser come on up, and uh, he's a professor in the literature program. And oh, we will now use our signaling technique for uh, <laughs> that slide. So, Richard, you can point over to the computer when you need a slide change. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> And thanks to everybody else for being here. Um, this particular project didn't begin in the Middle Ages, but rather with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and an NBC re uh, correspondence report on the sounds of the opening barrage. Boom. Um, that's what she was really um, impressed by. And as she speaks on TV, there is in her somewhat fixed stare a hint of terror of having been a visual and auditory witness to an immense scene of such destructive power that it is difficult to take it all in. As uh, J. Martin Dotery has termed it, she has been affected by the bellophonic, the sounds of warfare, and that means all of the sounds connected with warfare. But there is also a stirring of something else uh, in her as she speaks, uh, namely a stirring of excitement, of what we might call the exhilaration of vicarious combat that has drawn spectators out to observe battling armies for centuries. And it is this sonic experience that has not just touched her, but has shaken her by its vivid intensity. This vicarious combat, the breathtaking experience of watching and hearing death by proxy, I suggest, in pitch battle or in the presence of a solitary weapon, also engage the senses of readers of and listeners to Middle English romances. It is true that the physical intensity of auditory vibrations produced by resounding weapons is missing in an exclusively textual experience of reading. And the same is largely true even if one listens while someone else reads out loud a text narrating the sounds made by shields, swords, and battle axes. And nevertheless, Cognitive research has shown that reading and listening, among other things, activate remembered experiences to create new ones. There is also suggestive evidence that, for example, the primary visual cortex is activated during recall, and that would mean that by imagining something visual, the brain is processing this imagined thing via the same pathways that are active during sensory perception with the same emotional responses. Um, if you, we can use smell and say that uh, whether you smell something or read about somebody smelling something or hear somebody reading about smelling something, <laughs> your brain lights up where you in the smell area of your brain. You are sensing that <clears throat> in your brain. The interconnection between emotions and senses is something that rhetoricians since Aristotle had commented on in examining the rhetorical device of an argeia, something I spoke about in a previous uh, flash talk, which was employed in the affective appeal of medieval literature. And Argea is the vivid actualization of dramatic scenes so that they appear to be immediately present to the mind's eye or the mind's ear of the reader of text or the viewer of art. 
this rhetorical device helps clarify the continuing appeal to sensory perception and its stimulation of emotional response in medieval texts. Vivid sounds, as readers will note, are regularly included in the narration of knights in combat in Middle English chivalric romances, even though the dominant mode of narration in this genre is visual. Vivid sounds are also a way of making a single weapon ring with more menacing and exhilarating tones. A case in point is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Gawain has been faced with increasing signs that he will die when he meets the Green Knight. What intensifies the fear of impending death for the reader as well as for Gawain is the deafening sound that greets him when he arrives at the Green Chapel. We get it, we get it, we get it, Green Knight. Um, and uh, what the text tells us is, then he heard from that hill behind a hard rock on the bank beyond the brook an amazingly loud noise. Lo, it clattered along the cliff as if it would cleave open, as if someone were grinding a scythe on a whetstone. Ah, uh, it whirred and whizzed like water in a mill. Ah, uh, it rushed and rang out wretched to hear. Uh, it is an alliterative poem, after all. Um, this is the Green Knight sharpening his massive Danish axe. Next one, next one, next one, next one. Thank you. Uh, you can see that large axe that he's got. And the effect of this vividly sonic onslaught is not only to instill, uh, instill fear in Gawain, but to heighten the fear for the romance's protagonist that has been building in the reader throughout the text, but also the exhilarating anticipation of experiencing death by proxy. As Steve Goodman has emphasized, fear produced by sound effects may be virtualized, but it is no less real. The sound of axe sharpening combines with the appearance of the Green Knight holding his axe to face Gawain. The massive object and its blaring sound work together to magnify the emotions of dread and excitement in anticipation of the hero's beheading. For the reader or listener, the object and its sound are keys to the production of fear and elation. Thank you. I have two roles today, so I had to bring a costume change. Um, I'll wait for the, while well, this is coming up. So what I'm about to uh, read um, actually began as an undergraduate project. So it's kind of fun to see students present their work, because you never know what it'll turn into one day. Um, all right, so you might see a resemblance there. Right? <laughs> so this is an excerpt uh, from the prologue of my forthcoming book, The Nonconformist, which is coming out in spring of 2023. Um, <laughs> I emerged from Prague's retro futurist metro, looked at my wristwatch, and realized I was already late for my appointment with a man named Carl Serp. The year was 2004, 15 years since the Velvet Revolution, and I traveled from California to the Czech Republic to follow the trail of the American beat poet, Allen Ginsberg. I wanted to better understand why Ginsberg had been expelled from the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic nearly 40 years earlier, three years before the start of the Prague Spring. Ginsberg had arrived unannounced in the winter of 1965, freshly deported from Castro's Cuba. He ended up staying behind the Iron Curtain for more than two months, spending much of his time in Prague. By springtime, Ginsburg had become a celebrity among the city's student underground. On May 1st, the American poet was elected as the ceremonial King of May at a massive student festival that had been banned for much of the communist era. Over the next week, Ginsburg was followed by the secret police, assaulted on the street by an undercover agent, brought in for interrogation, and deported from Czechoslovakia. On the outbound plane, he wrote some of his most powerful, spontaneous verses in years. And I am the king of May, that I may be expelled from my kingdom with honor as of old, to shew the difference between Caesar's kingdom and the kingdom of the May of man. Serp had asked me um, to meet him outside the Malostranska metro stop at the foot of Prague Castle. 
He was waiting there when I arrived, an ageless and ebullient character dressed in all black. All I knew about Serp at the time was that he had been briefly imprisoned in the late 1980s as the leader of an illegal countercultural organization known as the Jazz Section, which had dared to publish Ginsburg's poetry during the repressive period known euphemistically as normalization. I followed Serp through the cobbled streets of Prague's little quarter until we arrived at an inconspicuous building tucked in the corner of a gated garden. Serp's cellar-like office was musty, but charming. Its bookshelves crowded with the familiar titles of American novels, walls covered in old jazz posters, the, the album Ray Charles in person was quietly playing on the turntable in the corner. After I explained to Serp why I had come, he smiled like the Cheshire cat and walked over to a filing cabinet next to the turntable. He rifled through some folders, pulled out a packet of documents, and handed it to me. The cover featured an enlarged black and white photograph of a procession making its way through Prague's Old Town Square. A festive motorcade is being led through a crowd by a young man, about my age at the time, his face framed by a white scarf and bowler hat. Above him, a banner proclaims, Ginsburg for King of May, as an expression of proletarian internationalism. Inside the packet, I discovered more photos from Ginsburg's visit to Prague, alongside photocopies of official-looking documents stamped with the word Tyne. As Serp explained, these secret documents were from Ginsburg's file with the notorious Statni Bespechnost, the communist era security services better known as the STB. These documents would ultimately, ultimately lead me to write this book. Looking back at the Czech language reception of beat literature during the uneven cultural thaw of the late 50s and 60s, the Czech playwright turned dissident, Václav Havel, referred to, quote, those who knew the literature and by fostering it, created through this common knowledge a brotherhood, a community of nonconformists, end quote. According to Havel, who met Ginsburg during his 1965 visit, this underground com community turned to beat writing, quote, as a potential instrument for resistance to the totalitarian system that it has been imposed upon our our existence, end quote. After reading an interview between Havel and the musician Lou Reed in 1990, Ginsburg himself suggested that the Czech reception of American counterculture, from the beats to the Velvet Underground, had created the conditions for the rise of the plastic people of the universe, the Charter 77 human rights movement, and the peaceful, cult, quote, cultural revolution, end quote, of 1989, which culminated in Havel's election as president. As Ginsburg put it, quote, all this in a straight line from rock and roll to closing the offices of the secret police, end quote. Mm -hmm. But as I began writing this book, I quickly discovered that the line connecting the Beats and other American writers to Prague's dissident underground and the Velvet Revolution was hardly straight, and it didn't run in just one direction. Thank you.